So, what really happened with two Russian planes that were targeted by Ukrainian air defense above Azov Sea? The information uh, in this video it is based on the work of Tom Cooper, a very well-known Austrian analyst. First, what were these planes that were shot down and why this loss is so painful for Russia? Brief A-50 was developed back in 1970s as an early warning aircraft required to support Soviet air defense force, foremost against the threat of low-flying uh, US strategic bombers and their cruise missiles. It is equipped with the Liana surveillance radar that has a maximum claimed range, uh, detection range of around 650 kilometers for very big aerial targets. And uh, onboard equipment is enabling it to simultaneously control up to 10 own interceptors. It is usual mission crew consists of 15 people and on average it can uh, remain on station for some six to seven hours and on this picture we can see that this is board A50U this is A50U board 50 serial number RF5601 and this is exactly this, the plane that was shot down by our forces over the northwestern Azov Sea on January 14, 2024 and the total of around 40 of such planes were constructed in the 1980s and 1990s. But as of 2022, only some 16 were still around, of which from 9 to 11 in flyable condition. And they were deployed so intensively during the first months of the Russian all-out invasion of Ukraine that since late 2022, they say that only three out of these 9 to 11 aircrafts were still f fully mission capable and which means that only three had all of their systems in fully operational condition so now what can an a50 do and why it is important this picture vividly illustrates how limited is the coverage by ground-based radars, rad radars. It is showing the coverage of a ground-based radar deployed in the Yevpatoria area. You can see here is Yevpatoria. Uh, Yevpatoria area of the Russian occupied Crimea. Here is the Crimea and it is occupied by Russia. Um, and it is one of the two main centers of the Russian air defense of this peninsula. As you can see, because of the local terrain and even if positioned on a top of uh, a 50 meter high um, mast, this radar can detect objects approaching from the north if altitude of this object is below 20 meters. So the green area is the uh, coverage for objects less than 20 meter in um, altitude. You can see that it cannot see anything uh, at, th at this altitude from the north. And uh, 100 meter, it is the yellow, er yellow color here. Also, you can it cannot see anything coming from the north at the altitudes of less than 100 meters. It has very limited detection capability uh, from the nose at the uh, altitude up to 500 meters, this orange. This is uh, the range at which it can detect objects coming uh, at the altitude of uh, less than 500 meters. It is 20 uh, approximately 20 kilometers away from the radar only. And uh, only going to detect any objects um, approaching from the north and operating at uh, altitudes above 500 meters, this red area, 
uh, and um, f- from the distance the, which is enough that enables um, which gives enough time for air defenses to react to this threat now if you put th- that same radar on the um, aircraft uh, flying at the altitude of 800 meters you can detect everything out of range of say 300 kilometers it's only going to encounter some problems uh, with low flying objects while uh, these are still underway um, at levels below 100 meter above the mainland above uh, to the north here And so, this is um, an undisturbed uh, wide uh, radar horizon. This is exactly why it is already since the 1940s 40s, that first uh, the British and then Americans and then my, much later on a few others began developing airborne, airborne early warning aircraft. So AEW aircraft. Uh, now, thanks to the development of informational uh, technologies, nowadays it is no big deal because there are um, uh, something like uh, so- something like um, a dozen different airborne early warning aircraft in service uh, w- w- with at least twenty different air forces around the world. However, one should keep in mind that back then, I mean in 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, and even in 1980s, radars were still very big and complex machinery, and the electronics that were supporting them, early computers, they were also very big and bulky, and thus it was very hard to pack all of this into an aircraft. You can see here some early um, samples, examples of uh, such aircraft. This to American, and this is British, American made by, by in uh, British Air Force. And the next uh, problem of uh, uh, for such aircraft was so-called ground clutter. Radar looking from above towards the ground is receiving lots of uh, echoes from the ground, even from the sea surface, especially if the weather is windy or if there is rain. This is called ground clutter, and until the invention of uh, microchips, and especially un- until the um, uh, related processors and software were developed to the necessary degree in the 1980s, these uh, airborne early warning aircraft were severely suffering from the ground clutter. And then there was a third problem, was uh, the problem of transmitting or downloading the resulting um, radar picture to the command post, to the headquarters on the ground. Uh, this um, aircraft uh, could carry its own crew to analyze uh, its radar picture and act correspondently, but generals prefer uh, seeing what, uh, what's going on and uh, to make their own decision. And uh, the issue was of such importance that the solution for it eventually led to the development of what we nowadays know as the Internet. Uh, It it led to the development of a network of emitters and receivers, and uh, some were on aircraft and others were on ground stations, and uh, these emitters and receivers could exchange huge volumes of data in real time. So, what is the difference between uh, aerial early warning and uh, AVAX? Uh, so, first, just installing a radar antenna at top of an F aircraft is not going to work, because the radar still needs a power source, and the bigger the antenna, the higher the power output of this antenna, the better uh, radar range you will have. And moreover, before the 2000s, 
older radar systems, they depended on antennas that were rotating around their axis in order to scan 360 degrees around them. And therefore, they required a power supply and mechanics necessary to rotate this huge antenna. And this is, for, the, for example, was the case with A50s. And you can see here A50. Uh, and um, also, such aircraft, uh, in addition to the air traffic controllers, the people who actually making use of the intelligence collected by the radar, they required working stations for the crew just serving the radar, the people who was just making sure that radar is actually working. And uh, then the plus powerful radio station and emitters and uh, the power supply for all of this. And that was the essence of the AEW aircraft. Meanwhile, in 1970s, the USA went a step further and Boeing not only installed a very powerful radar, very powerful processors and excellent software, working stations for radar operators, radio station and communication equipment into its uh, E3 Centri aircraft, but also working stations for flight controllers, electronic warfare systems, even stations for linguists capable of monitoring um, enemy radio communications in real time, plus a um, room enabling the crew to take rest during their long missions. You can see here, rest area. Um, and these missions were often stretching well beyond eight hours. And you can see this, you know, cut out of exploded view or how it is called uh, with all the systems that were inside this huge aircraft uh, and uh, this all came into um, being uh, thus came into being the um, uh, term airborne early warning and control aircraft AVAX so it is goes beyond just early warning uh, Generally, and until this very day, AVAX aircraft are much bigger, they are more complex, and uh, much, much more expensive than just uh, aerial uh, early warning aircraft. Soviet Union of the uh, 1980s was lagging behind the West in regards of micro technologies and thus the capabilities and uh, performances of the A-50 were at most compared to the Grumman E-2C Hawkeye. You can see he it here. You, it, it's actually U-2 E-2D Hawkeye, but uh, the previous, the predecessor of this craft um, from the early 1970s. So it was on par of much smaller uh, aircraft uh, used by U.S. Navy. Uh, from 19 with equipment from 1970s, so it it was not actually an AVAX, it was an uh, aerial uh, early warning aircraft. <clears throat> A50 has got a um, relatively powerful radar, but it was still suffering from ground clutter because processors and software used to support that radar were not good enough to complete, completely clear the picture. Its communication equipment was lacking, it lacked most of electronic warfare equipment, and so on. It was only in 1990s and in 2000 that the Russians slowly introduced some improvements, and eventually this led to a major upgrade in the form of A50U, U means усовершенствованный, means uh, enhanced or modernized, uh, which saw the installation of new processors. And uh, that way, the A50U, this new version of the aircraft, became effective over the ground as well, not just over the sea. 
However, the A50 communications and electronic warfare facilities were still insufficient, limited enough that for most of the time it acted as a mere air traffic control and always has to be uh, accompanied by Illusion Il-20M electronic warfare aircraft and Il-22M airborne command post. So here you can see the Il-22M airborne command post of the VKS and pay attention to all this um, big antenna farm at top of the fuselage. This is necessary to support all the communication equipment installed in this aircraft. And here is Il-20M electronic warfare aircraft or electronic intelligence gathering aircraft. And um, they are necessary for operation in conjunction with A-50 because the Russian-made electronic warfare equipment is still much too big uh, and it's taking too much space and requiring too much power supply uh, to stuff all this into A-50. So, because of all these limitations, Russian initiated the development of a true AVAX uh, in the form of uh, the A-100. But uh, Putin's Russia is so highly efficient that in 20 years of, of uh, Putin's rule, it managed uh, to roll out eight or nine NA-50Us and only one A-100 and this is not actually uh, is uh, it, it is not actually um, commissioned it is still in the um, uh, it, it should be it should get into operation the, this a100 um, a100 in uh, 2016 now it was postponed to 2024 and i don't know when actually it, it is going to be fully operational and then A-50s and uh, accompanying Il-20S and Il-22 were so intensively deployed early during the all-out invasion in Ukraine that one after other failed and their mission equipment required, required repairs and crew needed rest and retraining. And um, the repairs were heavily dependent on the acquisition of IT technologies uh, of the kind not manufactured in Russia means they either could not be repaired or it takes quite a time to procure uh, needed components and repair them. And then one of the A-50Us was damaged by Ukrainian drone while forward deployed in Belarus. And also one Il-22M was shot down by Wagner mercenaries during their uprising in June of the last year, the mutiny in June of the last year. And eventually, and eventually, eventually as mentioned before, only three A-50 remained fully mission capable as of early this year. So, what happened on 14th January uh, 2024 over the Azov Sea? Based on what can be heard in the social media, the development went uh, so, some, something like this. On uh, January 13, 2024, Ukrainian air forces flew a series of airstrikes against Russian ground-based radars and uh, air defense systems on the occupied Crimean Peninsula. A number of uh, raiders were knocked out. As a result, the Russians ordered one of the few A-50Us into the air and uh, to complement their aircraft with insufficient equipment for the task, as usually this was accomp accompanied uh, by an Il-22M airborne command post and probably by an Il-20M electronic warfare aircraft too, as they usually do. But the radar range of the A-50U was too short to detect incoming Ukrainian aircraft and missiles from sufficient distance. 
Thus, the aircraft has to operate very close to the front line, as little as 80 to 90 kilometers from it. And this was not a problem, at least as long as no Ukrainian surface to air systems with a longer range were around. And not only Ukrainian airstrikes caused uh, Russian uh, generals to order A-50U and the Il-22M closer to the front line, but simultaneously VKS also flew its own air strikes. And uh, as usual, the two aircraft were escorted probably by at least a pair of uh, Su-30 interceptors and um, some Su-34s were releasing uh, some uh, KH-59 standoff precision guided munitions at targets in Ukraine. And um, all this, all this Russian activity attracted quite a lot of Western attention too. Uh, you can see this not up uh, uh, drone and it uh, passed uh, in Black Sea and um, the um, events were in this area and it was uh, collecting data here in this area, this uh, North of Grubin. And uh, certainly enough, enough this helped uh, uh, our forces to plan for following operation. <clears throat> what is known next is the crew of one of SU-34s reported that its own electronic warfare system have recorded a radar emission of one of Ukraine S-300, which previously was not known as being there. S-300 is a um, uh, long-range uh, anti-aircraft system, surface-to-air missile system. And then minutes later, A-50 and Il-22 were targeted by surface-to-air missiles, the A-50 Board 50 serial number RF-5601, which I was showing at the beginning of this video, it was hit, set on fire and crushed in the marshes south of Preslav, probably with the loss of its entire crew. And uh, Preslav is somewhere here, in this area. Um, and the missile aiming for the Il-22 22M, it proximity fused near its target, peppering it with shrapnel, and according to reports in social uh, in Russian social media, at least two crew members were killed, two others wounded, and one of them is still in critical condition. But the crew managed to fly the badly damaged aircraft back to Anapa airport and landed it safely. Here is Anapa. And uh, all this action was going on around this area. And you can see the, you know, the peppered uh, tail of this uh, Il-22M. So, how could this happen? And what can be said about the methods that were used by Ukrainians to achieve this spectacular success, because this is the first time that uh, such an um, aircraft was shot down. While it's obvious that this was an ambush by one or two of um, um, air defense systems of the PSU, PSU means Pavitrinne Silu Ukraine, um, Ukrainian Air Force. Uh, some are guessing because of the um, of the emission from S-300 radar that uh, Ukrainians have deployed one of their so-called Franken sums, uh, that um, Patriot missiles uh, mated to S-300 systems. And sure, this is possible, but um, Thomas Cooper thinks that this was uh, this, that this wasn't a result of such a complex affair. That things working this well are usually based on much simpler solutions. So our air forces has made air strikes on the Russian air defense system on the occupied Crimean Peninsula on 13th January, and. Um, 
it have uh, forced the Russians to react the way our forces could predict them to react. A day later, on 14th January, January they pushed the A-50U closer to the front line. And when one is behaving in predictable fashion, one is easily easy to ambush and to kill. Now, all that our people had to do was to secretly deploy a suitable surface-to-air missile system to target the two aircraft from long range. Perhaps this was one of our S-300 systems or perhaps one of our Patriot PAC-2 PAC, PAC or PAC-3 system. So far it is unclear which uh, system was used. And it is also possible that uh, our forces have deployed a launcher and a ra radar plus power supply equipment from one of our three Patriot systems in so-called assault mode. It means that only one launcher, only one radar and uh, necessary for them uh, power systems and uh, they used it in the combination of uh, one of our S-300 radars. So, as soon as uh, S-300 ra radar detected suitable targets, it provided the azimuth and range to the Patriot system. The Patriot system powered up its radar only for a few seconds, long enough to obtain its own targeting data, but too short for the Russians to dependably detect its emissions and assess them as a threat. And then it started firing missiles. How many it is not uh, clear, but uh, it is uh, perfectly possible that some of these were working in so-called home to jam mode. And essentially they were homing into the electronic warfare emissions from the Russian aircraft. And uh, when they finished firing, crews of S-300 and Patriot promptly ceased emitting, started packing their systems and moved them away and thus uh, trying to avoid any possible Russian retaliation. And meanwhile, after traveling some 90 to 120 kilometers away from launching points, these missiles killed that A-50U and damaged the Il-22M. And of course, there is no hard evidence that this has happened exactly that way, but it is the way Tom Cooper would have done it if having the equipment shown, uh, equipment known to be operated by the um, uh, Ukrainian Air Force. So, this is probably how it happened. Thank you for watching this video, have a nice day, and Slava Ukraini!